Welcome to the second part of the video lecture on systemic ideation. In the first part, we covered enhancement and derivation as two thinking styles for approaching ideation systematically. In this second and final part, I will continue with the third thinking style, which we call utilization. And the key idea here is that we tap into assets. Now, let me start with an example to explain this idea. What you see here is a website called parkatmyhouse.com. Um, and it was a British web page where people could rent out their parking lot, their driveway, um, that happened to be in the vicinity of a major public uh, spot, like here in this case, Heathrow Airport. Um, in different examples, it might be a soccer stadium or um, a concert hall, something like this. And you could rent out your own private driveway for people that wanted to go to such a public event location and look for a cheap place to, to park. Yeah. Now, the key insight here, what most people don't know, is that this parkatmyhouse.com is an initiative sponsored by BMW, the uh, German automotive manufacturer. So they sponsored a little startup that developed parkatmyhouse.com as a solution where people can rent out their private driveways because BMW wanted to offer the service to their own clients and saying, we BMW not only give you a nice car, we also give you space to park. Yeah, that's a value added service. A second example is from Sweden where um, the Swedish postal service started MyWays, which is an app that allows people to pick up deliveries and deliver them on behalf of the Swedish Post to, to whoever they, they want. So if you happen to drive from Karlstad to Stockholm or from Stockholm to Jönköping um, and you have to go there anyway and the Post has to deliver a couple of parcels, you may as well pick them up and make a few bucks on the side. Um, so outsourcing basically the fact that private people drive between different locations. So the Postal Service has to deliver the parcel. Yeah, so DHL in Sweden sources drivers for the delivery of parcels in Stockholm from the crowd instead of going themselves. Now, both of these examples are examples of what we call utilization. The key thing to realize here is that they, this is a resource focused thinking style. That's very different from enhancement and derivation, both of which are practice focused, where we look at what we're currently doing. Here we look at resources we're currently having. And in particular, we're looking at the so-called idle assets. So we're looking at resources, capabilities, people, skills, any sort of asset that we have available in our ecosystem that are idle. That means that are not utilized fully um, and thereby could be hidden solutions for future problems. Yeah. So for this approach to work, we need to figure out what our assets are that we have in the ecosystem, which means that we either own or are able to access. Yeah. And then we ask how utilized, how much of this capacity do I actually use at the moment? Or do they have capacities um, that I'm not using fully at the moment that I could utilize to create a new solution for a problem I didn't even know I had? So I could think about assets that are owned or access that I could use in better ways, in different ways, or I could try to find new assets, hidden assets that we could access that we didn't even know we have in our ecosystem. Let me give you some examples. The first one is an example for utilization of owned assets. So Walmart, um, the American retailer, has assets that it's not utilizing fully. And the assets that I'm talking about are parking lots. So every store in every Walmart store has a big parking lot where people can park while they go shopping. Now, this only makes sense as long as the store is open. So assume that the store is open from eight to eight, which means that overnight from eight to eight, the store is closed and the parking lot is empty. So here's an asset that is not utilized fully. It is at most utilized 50% of the day, if that. So Walmart had the idea of utilizing this location, a parking lot, usually in a very prime location in an inner city suburb, for example, where they could sell it as a parking lot to people that would demand it, for example, because otherwise they wouldn't even be allowed to park. 
yeah, if you have an RV, a caravan, or camper van, you're typically not allowed to park in a city. And even if, there's usually no space for you. But Walmart offered overnight parking solutions where you could utilize an otherwise empty parking lot um, for, in exchange, of course, for a little bit of money. These are assets that we own and that are fairly obvious. A second example is about utilizing what are called hidden assets. So assets that we have that we're not really aware of. And I've brought three examples here. Uh, one is um, on the bottom left, you see taxi drivers. Now you may or may not know that taxi drivers on average are idle 65% of the time. So two thirds of the time of a taxi driver, they spend waiting for example, in a queue at an airport or at other major locations, they're waiting for people to come in and utilize the taxi two thirds of the time. What most taxi companies don't realize is that usually you have in fairly international staff. Uh, so a, a working staff that are you know coming from a very diverse ethnic, a regional, cultural backgrounds. Um, and very often they're very interesting skills. Um, they speak multiple languages, they might have a different career, different professions before they became a taxi driver and so forth. And they're idle most of the time. So one taxi company um, started utilizing their taxi drivers while waiting in a queue as a different service. For example, they started uh, providing translation and certification, language certification services by utilizing cab drivers that spoke multiple languages, like Chinese, Indian, Spanish, French, German, English, whatever. Uh, so they could make additional value revenue through um, providing services for payment while they were waiting for taxi drivers. Um, on the right, you see uh, passengers in an airplane, which is a hidden asset that most airline companies are not utilizing. So the fact that you have access to a lot of people, typically several hundreds, that are in your airplane for a certain amount of time. So if you're flying Qantas from um, from Brisbane to, to Dubai, you have access to the 400 people for about 13 hours. If you're flying uh, Sydney, LA, uh, Dallas, it's 16 hours. Um, so one airline company that I shouldn't be naming here um, started selling access to certain individuals on the plane, you know, when mutually agreed as a service. So you might be in economy or business class and there might be an angel uh, investor or a, a venture capitalist or you know a, the director of a major bank or God knows what else um, available in on board and you might have a professional interest in, in, in connecting with these people. So connecting to people on an airplane as a hidden asset that I could utilize to create a new solution for problems we didn't even know we have. I wanted to give you a third uh, example of utilizing hidden assets, which are learning from people in your workforce. Yeah. So here the idea is that we have in a large workforce, typically we have what are called deviant performers. So people in our workforce that are meant to do the same as everybody else, but some of them do things a little bit differently and importantly, do things better. So positive deviance is an approach in utilization where we try to learn from the best, not the worst, hidden practices. So in any workforce, mostly performance is fairly normally distributed. So we have a typical bell curve. Most people are pretty average um, and they perform similarly. Of course, you have low performers, you have people that work differently and uh, worse than everybody else. But you also usually or statistically guaranteed, you will have high performance. People that perform better than everybody else under equal circumstances by doing things differently. Let me show you some stories from research we have done on positive deviance in settings such as bakeries, postal service, franchises, and supermarkets. What is common among all of these is they're all fairly standard. So if you are a retail organization and you have thousands of supermarkets, all of them are run similarly. You have standard operating procedures, role descriptions, uh, KPI set up that apply to all of these supermarkets or to all bakeries or to all postal shops. If you're a post shop, you have to sell letters, you have to sell postal services. You know, it's all fairly standard. Um, however, in a large enough group, 
So if you have a thousand supermarkets, a thousand bakeries, or a postal shop in every postcode area, which are you required to do by law, then I can guarantee that most of them will ever will will be average, will be performing similarly. Some of them will be worse than everybody else, but there will be a a quantity, a percentile that will be doing things slightly different and will be performing better than everybody else. And these are the positive deviants that we're trying to find. I'm going to zoom into a study of bakeries here, right? In a retail store, in a supermarket store, you typically have a bakery there that sells bread rolls, packaged bread, um, and, 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 and cakes and stuff like this. Now, you can ask yourself, what would be a positive deviant in a bakery might be? So for that, you could have a look at, oh, look, how many bread rolls do they sell, given how many customers come into the store? Obviously, if you have a store that is in downtown New York City, or let's say in Sydney, in Australia, you would have more people coming in and hence you sell more bread rolls than when you're in the outback, uh, in the desert or in, um, in, in, in Utah, God knows where else, right? So there's obviously a correlation there and we would expect sales to vary by customer penetration in a way that you can see here, which are actually supermarket stores with bakeries, uh, in this case in Australia, um, and they're all fairly normally distributed, right? So they all follow this diagonal line. The more customers, the more they sell. Yeah, and the average line would be actually here. Now, what we could do statistically, we could have a little bit of a band. You could say, look, there's average, but there's gotta be a little bit of deviations here, right? So we can have a, a band of performance. And what you see here are the 95% confidence intervals. So 95% of all bakeries in the, in the country are within the average or plus or my, minus 5% of that. Yeah, And you can see, if we look at this data this way, we have two positive deviants. We have two bakeries that sell more bread rolls given the level of customer penetration that they have. They should be within the band. They're well beyond that. You can also see, by the way, here that and there's a few negative deviants. So people that sell less, uh, stores that sell less bread rolls, given how much customers they have. But we don't worry about them. We can't learn much from them. We want to learn from the positive deviants that are performing better. And we want to figure out whether they're doing anything differently. Yeah. For that, of course, we need to identify the deviant procedures, um, which typically means you have to go and have a look at what these people are doing. So in our case, um, you can see me here. Um, with safety gear on getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning to be in the bakery with uh, the employees and the staff baking bread rolls for when the store opens. Yeah, so you have to do a little bit of research to identify what it is that these people are doing differently. And then you figure out a variety of, uh, of deviant procedures that lead to more performance. And here are some examples of this, and I'm going to uh, tell you these three quick stories. So number one, in the deviant stores, we learned that the bakers were on request creating personalized cakes and cupcakes and muffins. So, for example, a local soccer mom would come in and say, it's the birthday of my husband tomorrow. Uh, can you write happy birthday on the cake? And standard operating procedure is no. Standard operating procedure is that we're going to sell chocolate cakes, say, and we're not individualizing them because that, you know, could, could be um, a lot of extra effort for very little additional money. The deviant stores disregarded this rule and sold for a little bit of a premium price, individualized cakes anyway, which led to all sorts of positive ripple effects. So they started selling more to this customer. The customer word of mouth led to more custo uh, customer attraction came in, so more compenetration, more sales, and so forth. A second example on the, third, on the, on the top right is the scheduling of the baking. So you have to see that standard operating procedures in bakeries is that you have to come in at 3 a.m. in the morning, start breaking bread rolls, so that by 8 a.m. when the store opens, you have freshly baked warm bread rolls to sell to customers. Now, in not in all stores do we have customer profiles where a lot of people come in at 8 a.m. in the morning. So, for example, in some of the um, um, business districts, a lot more customers would come into the store in the afternoon on their way home from work, and they would shop for dinner, not for breakfast. So at that time, bread rolls would be stale, soggy, and cold. 
So some of the Deviant store disregarded the procedure for baking schedule, and instead of getting up at 3 a.m., they started baking at 1 p.m. to have the bread rolls ready to go and warm and crisps at 5 p.m. when the when person when the uh, when the customers would come in and shop for dinner. Simple change, simple deviation, huge performance effects. So what we have done is we identified these procedures and the, the ones that showed great performance, and they then got implemented in a redesign of uh, the bakeries. So what do you see here in this, in our context in Australia, this is what the remodeled bakeries looked like. Um, and you can't really see this from the picture other than that it looks nice. But one of the key things is, for example, is that now everybody was allowed to use a variable oven schedule. So before the standard operating procedure was you come in at 3 a.m. and start baking, the new operating procedure was here's your uh, oven. You're free to bake whenever, but every week we give you a profile of customer visits to the store by time. So you see whether you have more customers coming in the morning during the lunch break or after work, and you can adjust your oven schedule accordingly based on your local customer profile. So what effectively happened here is that the learnings from the positive deviance, the hidden asset, the people and what they were doing differently now became the standard operating procedure for everybody else. Yeah. And that is the power of utilizing positive deviance, hidden assets by looking at better practices by people in your workforce. What we normally would do is if you had a number of units, say staff, say outlets, say stores, and you normally get an S-shaped curve, which means that most are just above or below the average. You have a bottom percentile where performance drops off and you have a top percentile where performance goes high. These are typically few, of course, and the performance is usually vastly better. Now, normal management practice would be that we start worrying about the bottom 10%. We look at the weak performance and we try to make them better. We try to get them closer to the average. So we're improving the bottom 10%, lifting their performance. When positive deviance and utilization, we do the opposite. We look at what the top 10% are doing differently and we make this the standard operating procedure for everybody else. So we're not improving the top 10%, we're improving the remaining 90%. Yeah, so we're lifting the performance of everybody and make them a little bit closer to the deviance by making the successful deviant practices that are shown to lead to performance and making that standard operating practice for everybody else. So that is a deep dive into one form of utilization of hidden assets, your people. I'll give you a fourth example um, for utilization, which is utilization of so-called mass assets. So assets you have available to access in your ecosystem, but you do necessarily own them in the sense that you own your workforce or your staff. So the idea here is that for ideation, for innovation, you utilize business partners, customers, and the wider environment that you have available through infrastructure such as um, social media or digital platforms. And there's a variety of very famous examples, Heinz Ketchup, uh, the iTunes App Store, Innocentive, or Lego Factory. I'll show you a very old uh, example to illustrate this. Um, there is a company that sells blenders in the United States, and they started a long time ago in the early days of the internet, they started a YouTube campaign where you saw the CEO of that company doing crazy videos where he put all sorts of stuff into the blender from a Coke can to a coconut to a golf ball to an iPhone and asked, can you blend it? The slogan of this company was that this was the strongest blender ever and it could blend anything. So he created a variety of, of little YouTube clips where he chucked all sorts of random stuff into the blender, asked, can you blend it? And of course, the blender could blend anything. Now, this, created, this then became a, an early viral video and you had lots and lots of people blending all sorts of stuff with this blender. So... In a way, this was very early viral marketing for free. Now, I'll give you a little bit more of a professional example, Threadless. You may have heard of Threadless. Threadless is a t-shirt design provider that works entirely with designs coming out of the crowd. So it's a platform where you as a person can upload your own t-shirt design. 
um, and sell it via this platform. And it only gets produced and sold when someone actually buys it. So you only upload digital designs uploaded by the crowd, by regular people. And in case you go up there and, and start shopping around and buy them, then the actual only the production process only starts. So these are all examples of utilization where we look at particular types of assets and the most common are people, data, technology. We start thinking about, can we use these assets that we're not utilizing fully to make things better, to do things differently and create entirely new value propositions. And let me wrap that up by going back to our now well-established example of the Empire State Building and now applying the utilization thinking stuff. In utilization, we would basically ask the questions, what are assets in the ecosystem of the Empire State Building that we could utilize in better, different or new ways? Yeah, what could be considered an asset that we're not utilizing fully and then create new value models from this? I'll give you one example. The Empire State Building, the tourist attraction, is only open by day. By night, it's closed. So you have a prime rooftop location in the middle of New York that you're basically effectively not utilizing when it's dark. How could you possibly utilize it? Well, for example, you could have a bar, a mile high club where people pay lots of money to come in and have a uh, beautiful city view at night while sipping a drink with an asset that you only own, but you're not utilizing. A second example is the stairways. Now, of course, the Empire State Building has fire escape stairs and um, they're not utilized because there's just by legal mandate a fire escape stairs and you use uh, the elevators, of course, because you have to go up something like uh, 500 meters, of course, from top to bottom. However, you could utilize this asset, for example, in what is called a vertical marathon. So a marathon that involves running upstairs to the Empire State Building. And this is not an idea. This is an actual thing that people do where they travel a particular period through New York streets all the way to the Empire State Building. And the final part of that marathon is running up all the stairs to the rooftop building where is this finish line for the marathon. And a third example uh, as a hidden asset is, of course, you could view all the visitors visiting the Empire State Building as an asset that bring to bear lots of uh, skills, experience, finances, whatever it may be, and you have access to their time while they're in your building. Yeah. So the question might be, a lot of them are just waiting a lot of the time. Can we possibly identify value models where we could tap into this? This was the third thinking style. And now comes the fourth and final thinking style, which is design, where we try to follow design process to innovate. And this is an approach that is actually better known under the umbrella term of design-led innovation. Again, this is an outside-in approach. So in, unlike enhancement or utilization, which are inward-focused, it's a little bit more like derivation in that it's outward-focused. We start looking outside of our uh, organization but unless, uh, unlike um, enhancement and derivation, which are practice focused and utilization, which is asset focused, design-led innovation is a focus on products and services. So it is focused on new artifacts that we're designing, new artifacts that we're designing, not assets that we have or our access, not practices, but artifacts that could be products and services. The other interesting insight here is that in this outside insert, what we're doing here is we're finding problem and solutions stemming from deep customer insights. So we're looking not at other organizations, not at our ecosystem, but at our customers. And we ask ourselves, what are the experiences that these customers are having? Can we empathize with them and understand where pain points might be? And then devise artifacts that provide value to the customers. Let me give you an example that illustrates this a little bit. When I do this in class, I would now normally go around and ask people, what do you see here? What do you think this is? And people would say, well, this is a coffee shop, a co-working space. These are typically the examples that I get. In fact, this is a bank. This is Umqua Bank, which is a bank in, in Sweden um, that has been redesigned through design and innovation. And in fact, looks more like a co-working space or a coffee bar. What they've done 
And these are other pictures from Umqua Bank. What they've done is they use design-led innovation to think about experiences that their customers are having, pain points, so bad experience that they could empathize them, and then start, started creating artifacts, new artifacts that help on this. For example, they started learning that one typical experience a customer might have is a busy mom that has three kids at home, kindergarten is closed, but she needs to go to the bank to do a transaction or to sign a piece of paper or to uh, get, get cash out. But she has all the kids with her and that's not a good environment. So she has to go into the city, uh, go in a bank, queue up to go to the cash counter and could support. That is one experience that a customer might have. So, what is a potential artifact that Umco Bank could offer? Well, for example, they could have a bit of a kids or entertainment uh, personnel at home that could create little distractions and occupy the kids for a while. You could have little tours in through the backstage of the bank. A second customer experience that they focused on was uh, the working man. The working man has to go to the bank to do a transaction, um, fill out a check, get some cash out, but he's busy at work and he needs to stop work to go to the bank. And the only time he can do that is during his own lunch break. So he has to forego his own lunch break to be able to go to the bank to fill out that transaction. Now, what is common here in both of these experiences that neither the, the mom, the busy mom, nor the working man want to go to a bank. They have to go to a bank and it, in their own journeys of what they're doing, it is usually a bad experience. Yeah, it's not usually something that they look forward, that they want to do, but something that they have to do and they have to sacrifice their lunch break or they have to deal with annoyed uh, kids at the same time. And again, Umqua Bank started thinking, what can I offer to this person? For example, I might offer him a working space so he can come during, lunch, uh, during working hours, continue working while he's waiting for a representative to talk to him to be able to file that transaction or you know, provide the service that they ask for. Yep. Or you could have a bit of a kitchen bar or a coffee bar. So at least when you are at lunch break, you can have that lunch break in a nice environment while you do your banking. As these experiences show, these are design and innovation. When we look at outwards, we look at the experience of customers and we look to empathize with certain problems, problematic experience that they're facing. A key tool we're using to this end is what's called the customer journey map. Customer journey map, it's like a process model or a value model, but it starts with a customer journey, not with our business process. So here's a template that you might want to use. For example, we could have a look at what is a typical customer journey um, when you go shopping. Now, the business process for shopping at a retailer starts when you're at the store, you pick up a shopping trolley, you go in and you start putting broccoli and, and tin cans of tuna into your shopping trolley, apparently. The customer journey starts much earlier. It starts at home when you're about to cook and you realize the milk has gone off or you realize the potatoes are gone or you need to buy some tomato sauce, otherwise you can't make your pasta. That's when the customer journey starts. And then it follows a couple of actions by certain actors. So for example, you have to dress your kid, put him in the car, find a car king lot, find a trolley with a child seat on top of it. And then you can actually start shopping where the business process begins. So customer journey map as a design tool allows you to capture these experiences by stepping through the actions that actors do and the artifacts they might use. So an artifact might be a shopping list. It might be a, uh, a child seat. It might be a shopping trolley. And importantly, in these customer journey maps, we don't just map out who's doing what, but also what are the experiences here? What are pain points? You know, what, which of these experiences are pleasant? Which of them are painful, cumbersome, are otherwise negatively annotated, right? Because this is where we want to focus on. We want to empathize with painful experiences and then solve them through novel artifacts. So here's an example of a completed customer journey map uh, in e-commerce where the story is about when people buy a new MacBook. Yeah, in this particular example. So this process for Apple starts when they go into the store, into the webpage and start buying a, a, a product. The customer journey starts much earlier. For example, your old laptop just broke and you need to find a replacement. Now, the emotion here is stress, frustration, anger. You might be in the middle of something. 
you might not be able to work anymore, right? And then we have a couple of other steps in the customer journey. For example, this entire search process here where you look for alternatives, you might be confused. It might be information overload here. You might feel lack of control. Um, and then you go through all the different steps. And as you can see here, there's a lot of um, emotions in these experiences at the different stages. And in design and innovation, we will now start to look for artifacts that we can create that can help with this. It could be an artifact such as a little, here's a guide to shopping for a new MacBook. It could be a little application that runs on your smartphone that uh, allows you to speak to a chatbot about your best options when your MacBook just broke, just to figure out whether you can repair it or replace it, and so forth, right? So we're looking for artifacts that we can design as solutions to pairs that are rooted in experiences. So we, the entire process is focused on solution problem pairs that we can, that we can create through artifacts. I'll give you another example for design-led innovation, which is the so-called NEST approach. NEST stands for Navigate, Expand, Strength, and Tune, and Takeoff. And it's another way of doing design-led innovation. And you can have a look at this video here um, by clicking on this video. This is a short um, video. There's also a long lecture on this. There's a one and a half hours long. And I put this um, link here as well. The idea here, it's, it's a rapid design-led process or a practice-based uh, uh, innovation methodology. And the interesting aspect here is that it utilizes the room in which you ideate. Yeah, so here we see a, a model of the four walls of a room and every wall, every side to the room has a particular meaning. On the right-hand side, you see the now, a where all the information is about what is currently happening, what the as-is situation is, what the present customer journey map is. On the left-hand side, you see the future in 20 days, 20 months, or 2020, so in 20 years, um, which is a space where you have information about your vision, what the new solution, what a solution might look like. Yeah, on the right-hand side, you see a problem. On the left-hand side, you see a solution to this. On the top, you see assets, people, systems, document, data, technology, everything you have available that you could utilize. And on the other side, on the final side of the wall, you have guidelines. So any constraints, restrictions, procedures, policies, legal mandates that are constraints. So the idea is that you can navigate through design and innovation by really walking from wall to wall. Yeah. On the right hand side, in the now, you have the problem. In the future, you have a solution. To get from the now to the future, you might have a look at assets and resources you could utilize while contemplating guidelines and constrictions that you might have available from policies and procedures. So by literally walking through the room and using the affordances of the walls, you can make sure yet that you're considering both sides of the story, both the problem and the solution to the problem-solution pair. Yeah, so that you have the current experiences that you think about the artifacts you have available and all the guidelines that you need to consider while creating new artifacts. Yeah. So again, it's a very placid, very material, very tangible way of doing design-led innovation in building problem-solution pairs by utilizing the fact that you have two contrasting viewpoints literally on opposite sides of the wall. Okay, let me finally illustrate this design-led innovation, the outward-in, customer experience, empathy-focused approach to ideating. So in our example of the Empire State Building, a leading question in design and innovation would be, what experience might customers be looking for? Or which experience do they have at the moment? And what artifacts could we create to tap into these experiences? When you start thinking about this way, you might get to very different types of solutions than from the other three approaches. I mentioned before the idea of that people might desire the experience of running up the stairs in the Empire State Building as a physical exercise. Yeah, so you see here a picture of the Empire State Building run-up marathon, where people make it a, an experience and they want to compete against themselves and others to see who, who gets to the top the fastest. There are other people that seek the experience of doing acrobatics in very, very high places. 
Yeah, so um, I'm not really sure what they're called, to be honest, but you, you, you might find a lot of them on YouTube where you see people doing all sorts of stunts uh, on the top of the highest buildings. So there's an entire crowd of people who want to do this, and that might be an experience that people are looking for. And you could consider what can we offer as a value proposition to these types of people. And finally, there might be people that have a, a longing for reenacting famous movie scenes. For example, you always wanted to be King Kong um, on the top of the Empire State Building. How might we um, create a value proposition for people seeking this type of experience where the pain point is that they're not allowed to do that? Final example, you might just have a hankering for climbing up uh, the highest buildings in the world. And again, or, of course, jumping down from them. Again, these might be experiences that people are seeking where they have painful experience at the moment because it's forbidden uh, or for otherwise infeasible. So that's what we're trying to figure out in design and innovation. Can we create artifacts as value propositions that we tap into journeys that certain customers might want to have and they feel at the moment have too many pain points? For example, they, they have that desire, but they can't just do it. Okay. This is the end of the four thinking styles. So let me sum this up. In ideation, what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop innovative ideas. We don't seek to critique. We don't want to judge them. We're not evaluating them yet. We're trying to develop and generate new ideas. These ideas, as maybe the examples that I've given you in these two lectures have shown you, they can be vastly different. They have multiple origin formats. They could be of very, very different kinds. You need to explore different ideation approaches to get this entire breadth and diversity of ideas. If you only focus on one thinking style, one methodology, you only get one type of solutions. What we want to have is we want to have as broad and diverse a set as possible so that during incubation and innovation, we can figure out which one of them is the best. Yeah. So by varying the thinking styles, by varying the strategies for coming up with innovation ideas, we can create and capture more ideas and we can vary the type of constraints that any one methodology or thinking style invariably brings with them. If you're thinking only in terms of utilization, you will only be resource and asset focused. If you're only with enhancing current practice, you will only be practice focused and you're very stuck to the common ways of doing because that's what you're looking at. Yeah. So to overcome this and to get as broad and diverse a set of potential innovations, um, you can use four different thinking styles. Number one, think in patterns to see a richer solution space for a given problem with the current practice. Number two, identify solutions that are proven to work in other sectors to see if they match one of the problems you might have. Third, identify idle assets and resources and explore how you could utilize them to create solutions for problems that may or may not yet exist. So hidden solutions for hidden problems. And fourth, ensure you understand expectations and desired experience of customers to identify entirely new solution and problem pairs. Yeah. So if I bring this together, Going back to the theory where we started about problem-solution pair discovery, where both the problem and the solution are not fixed, but both of them are variables, you can see here how these different thinking styles treat problem-solution pair discovery in different ways. In enhancement, we find a problem and apply a set of change plan to find a matching solution for that given problem. In derivation, we do the opposite. We see a working solution and see if that solution matches a problem that we have it. Yeah, so we take the solution as given and look for a problem. In utilization, we look at underutilized assets and try to find new solutions that pairs with a future problem. And in design, we are really building problem-solution pairs by employing user-centric design thinking. This brings me to the end of these two sets of lectures, this video recording about system, systemic ideation to generate innovation ideas consciously. All of this material is based upon a set of readings and I've listed them here and under the links, you can download all these papers if you wanted to. Um, and I've included two sets of readings here for you. One of them is about the systemic ideation idea and the innovation as a process model where we started off with. 
And the second one is about this one deep case study that I gave about utilizing people as hidden assets through positive deviance and the stories from the retail sectors and the bakeries, if you want to read up on them. Thank you very much for listening and for watching. Do reach out, stay in touch, um, or connect with me.